So let's talk a little bit about your early life to the extent that you recall it. What, what was it like growing up in, in Cambodia? My life in Cambodia, bad life. Like a lot of the women and children who have been born in Cambodia with a, with a big word, come on, I don't know how to say it. I was born without parents, I don't know my parents. I don't know my name exactly, and I don't know my age. But that, that for me is okay, but you know, have been slave, have been victim, or have been raped. That is big, that is big, big, like, it's a big, it's like suffering. Suffering is not just, sometimes it's, you know, it's not just like have been like no parent or stay in the street, cold, but also have been, you know, raped and slave all time. And then after have been also like the society didn't recognize you. It's mean like everything is my fault because I was born very bad luck. And I can tell you that all the children, me, including me, we always have dream like you. We want to go to school, we want to have the parents, and we want to get love. And we want to, we want to have everything like you, but we have born without nothing. So that is my life. Well, tell us a little bit about how you were forced into a life of slavery. How did it happen originally? I just want to talk on behalf of all the victims and the people who have been dying, who have been now. They have no opportunity to come with me. You know, like, when you stay in the street, I was stay in the street. So it's like, I mean, like, no parent, the people who give you food, you have to be slave in the, in the house. And then it's easy to get abused and easy to get raped. And then it's always, in, I always dream to have the family. And I have always dreamed to have mommy and dad. And when they come up, a man, he, he, he tell me that he's grand, my grandfather. He come to my hometown, and my home, I was not speaking uh, Khmer, I'm ethnic minority. It's me that the people in the mountain. He come and then he tell that his grandmother, he's my grandfather, and he bring me to, to f try to find out my family, to reach my family. And I was so, I think that I was so, so happy. I think that, okay, my God, I have now my family and my mom can hold me. And like, no one, they treat me again, but... So I live with him. I live my hometown. But the thing that he don't speak ethnic like me and I don't speak his language. But the attitude the first day that I live with him and I look at him and think, that is wrong for me, that I live my hometown. In my hometown, that I have been like you know, even street in the street, but the people they don't care much. But it's fine, my life. And going with him, like I have to work very hard. And then after he sold me in the brother, he sold me in the brother. So, and I think before he sold me in the brother, he, he sold me with the. Um, I think that you read my book, a Chinese guy, and I think that is my first time that I was. I was dead in my life, like, I had been raped by him, and then when I come back, you know, he asked me, Somali, you go and buy the, buy the, pet I don't know how to say petrol, because in Cambodia we have no light like you here. So going in, and the guy raped me, when I come back, and he's beating me because he's waiting me for food. And I think this time my life is done. It's dead in, inside. So after, I have been so in Brussels many years, but I don't care. How many years was this your experience? You know, we have, I'm in the Brussels, we never count time, day or years. I have been until 1990, 1990 I have been escaped. But escaped from the Brussels, it's not easy, I just want to share with you too, because a lot of the people, they. They didn't understand. They tell us like, she was she was in the brothel. Why she don't she don't escape from the brothel? I can tell you that one day you have been raped, you have been 
in the Brussels for many years and have been all the clients. You have no idea to escape from the Brussels. Even sometimes you have idea to escape, but why you have to escape from the Brussels? Who help you? Who love you? Who give you a new life? It's better stay in the Brussels because you have the victim around you, you have girl with you because we are the same life, we can understand each other. And I think that one day, why I'm escaping? Because I never want to escape from the brothel. And one day it happened that a little girl, she came in, in my life, she came in the brothel. She been sold, she was around maybe 12 or 10 years old, I don't know that exactly. And I was very friendly with her because she's dark skin like me. And in Cambodia, I think that we have maybe some Asia here. We don't love the dark skinned people. We are dark, like, they are very, very discrimination between dark and white. So she arriving and then, like, the client, you know, she's new or she's young, so the client, they don't care about the dark, but they just care about she, her virgin. And she have a lot of client, and one day she tell me, today I have, I'm sick, and I have a lot of client, I don't want to go again. And I tell her that I cannot help her because the people that don't love also help. And around midnight, I don't know the time, the people call us to come together, we sit together, and he tell us that you are our slave, you have to do like what we ask you to do. And I didn't get from her the story, and then after he take the gun and kill her. And that I just look at him, all the girl was crying, I'm not crying. And the image is keep to me until now. I cannot even sometimes sleep without thinking about her. I just tell her, I have to run out. I have to go out and marry with them. People have power, but who want to marry me? No. Who? Men have courage to, mar to marry with the girl like me? No way. So I just write, okay, I get out to take a gun and kill them back that the first day I managed to get out of the brothel. So you, you eventually escaped, and how, how did that come about? Was it something you did largely by yourself, or did you have help from others? Uh, how long did it take to actually secure your escape? It's take, it's take a long time. I have been like, you know, I was feel very bad about her, but at the same time I was free to win the brothel because I'm not so beautiful like everyone, and then they just let me out. And then I was sitting in the, um, in the gardens, and luckily I have a man, foreigner man coming, and he speak me, he talking to me, and I talking to him. And I tell my story because he's come to me, you know, and then he, this peop, he's get me out. He helped me, he bring me to the hospital, and then, yeah, I start to get out and then after I meet my husband and he's really bring me out of, of that. But you know sometimes you are out of your body but your mind you still have problem and I have very bad bad problem with my husband too. But he's very great to me. He's he's understand everything. And when did you decide that you were going to make it your life's work to ensure that other people who are in this environment are, are, are freed, and once freed, they're brought back into the mainstream of society. You know, I was married with him, and then after I was in France for one year, and I think that I have to escape this country, because this country is make me, it's, it's make me very, ma very bad souvenir, so I just want, okay, I want to leave. But the problem is like, I leave my country in France, but I cannot close my eyes. I cannot close my eyes because I have a few friends die. And then after that, I have a lot of friends who die. And then after smiling, client, and then, and then I tell to my husband, I have to go back. Because now I speak French. You know, I take three months to speak French. And then I think that now I can do something for my country. And then after my husband get a job. So we go back to Cambodia in 1994. We live in 1993. In 94, we go back. And then my husband, he working, and then at the same time, I, uh, I, I was asking the director of, the, of my, my husband that I want to volunteer and help them. 
And they asked me, okay, Somali, I know what you're from, so we need you to make a research on a condom so that I'm going back to the brothel working with the girl and then my life come back. My life is really going back. Memory or my memory coming back and then I was talking with my husband that please help me. I try to talk with the MSF, MSF is Médecin Sans Frontières in, in French. And I talked to them because in the brothel, I meet a girl who had been beating by the client. Like they, you know, they beating her and then they really destroy her. And then I talk to him like how we can help her. And she, she help, she tell me that you can bring me to the clinic. You give me the condom, but at the night time, I have the client come to me and I have the pimp killing me. So please bring me out of the brothel. And that I just remind remind me what was I need before. So I help her, but how I can help her? I have no money. And I asked my boss, like, can we help her? And he said, you know, Somali, we have our objective. And our objective is not helping them. He just provide them the condom. And then I think that is it. So I asked all the friends around me and asked that if they can give me some money. So I bring her out and I try to bring few girls and after six of them that I bring them out and then the PIM they get know that I was bring them out and one day they just come and then they take the gun and they just want to kill me and then after all the people come in and he say he killed me and I tell him okay if he want to kill he killing you know I'm not afraid of that because my life is dead he's dead already and he cannot because MSF is a big association in Cambodia. They have been recognized by the governments. And then after the police come and arrest him. And then after I have to, they force me to leave this province. So I come back to Phnom Penh to the town and my husband, now he's helping me. And then after I'm, I have been saved, like 12 girls come in my house. They say I have one, one year. And then after my husband gets very crazy. He tell me I have no personal life anymore. I have one room and 12 girls here, so now it's Finnish and French. I'm not Cambodian like you. It mean like the Cambodian people, we are always around each other. But you guys have what? Have your room, have your space. So, and then that is be starting. And then I have a lot of friends who give me house, give some food. And then, you know, like we start step by step. But I can tell you that they inspire me every day. Even I'm here today because of them. They're so lovely girl. They have been through many things and they keep sent up and show you that, that they have hope, they have dream. And to see them, you know, I was myself, I was around maybe 12 years old, maybe 10 years old, but they are four or five years old, have been raped. And then selling the brothel, they come back. Some of them have HIV aid. And she tell me, mommy, she, they call me grandma. I have to stand up and I take the medicine. And one of them, she remind me a lot. She was five years old selling the brothel. And she have pneumonia, she had tuberculosis. And the doctor tell me that we give you six months, she going to die. But I think my love, we are always around her. She stand up. And now one year, she have her hair back. She survived, she go to school. But a lot of the case, a lot of the children have been, you know, first time when they're coming here, they lost the family, they lost everything. Those, they are like my life, they're the part of my life. And helping them is great. I can tell you, maybe Bill can share, can share with us. In my life now, I have been in my life. He come in Cambodia, just visiting us, and then, He's changing life. Girls changing you. They are so lovely. They need nothing from you. Nothing, just love. And hold them, talk to them, kissing them. They're not ugly. They're so beautiful girl. How many girls are in this situation would you estimate in Cambodia? Are there any accurate numbers or estimates? We don't have exactly the number because between the governments and the association, we have very wrong, very different number. So if I give you the number, I'm, I'm not. But in our association in Cambodia, since we opened 
um, now we are more than six, 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 six thousand girls that we have been helped from the brother and a lot of them they are now in the reintegrated in the shelter now we have more than 200 girls in in the shelter in Cambodia we have also in Laos in Vietnam and in Thailand can you give us a sense of how widespread the problem is this is something that's not limited just to a few large cities this is something that happens throughout the country? I think the question you maybe sometimes, I think the sociology or the people have more outreach to they can respond to you, but by my side, what I see is like, a lot of people, they tell because of poverty, why uh, we have this happen, but I just, I'm not believe just um, poverty. I think poverty, poor educations, the girl have, like, they don't send the girl, the, the girl have no right to go to school and then the children have no right to talk to, you know, to say no to the parents. And so inequality between men and women. And also I think mentality. Because example, one girl has been raped, it's her fault. Because she born bad luck. How about the client? It's not their fault. How about the men who rape her? It's not their fault. One of our girls, she was raped. So now she's suicide. Two months ago, she's suicide. She leave us. She was seven years old. She had been raped by a man. He cut her. He destroyed her. And then the police save her and then send her to her mother. And her mother say, no, she's born very bad luck. I don't want her. So they have to call us. We go in and we bring her to us. But she's seven years old. And she miss her brother. She miss her family. She want to go back to her family. But the family don't, didn't want them. That is so hard. And then the people say, he had been raped, she had been raped by the clan, and also she had been like, her mother refused her to give her, and then the society. And when we go to the court, the court tell us that it's her, it was her fault because she wears a skirt. In Cambodia, seven years old, she wears a skirt. So what is what a human right? You know, here I, we made the book, you are a lawyer. And then for me to meet lawyer, to meet the, like we talk about human rights and human rights for whom, but not for victim. I can tell you when you are victim, you're always victim, no one help you. No one try to understand you. Money can buy everything. But you tried to help by setting up your foundation. How did that come about? The foundation, you have maybe asked question to Vera, and why the foundation? You know, I just my idea just try to help them to get out of the brothel and provide them the training and um, the business. I just want them to be independent and then say no to the family, not always accepting everything. And f since 2000, uh, we open. And I have always faced the problem with fitting the girl, you know, how to, because we have almost like 300 girls in the shelter, we have to give them food. And I have very much and always big problem, and then get, I get no Bill Livermore on 90, uh, 2006, and he helped me to set up the project, to set up the foundation here, Somali Mom Foundation here in the United States. First of all, to raise money to helping us in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos, because we have to feed these, these children. And secondly, like, also to let you know what's happened in our country is happening in your country. But the big, big, big uh, objective is like, the foundation, we focus on the, on the, empower the victim to become the survivor, and empower the survivor to become the part of solutions, because, you know, everywhere when you're going, just the people, they talk on behalf of the victim. But we never get the victim themselves talking. That is not fair. It's not fair, and I think it's not fair. Now, of course, that I'm traveling, uh, traveling a lot, the people they want me to talk, but I want my girl to talk, because I'm now I'm enough, I'm out of the situation. I just try to help them, and then also to empower, empower the victim to be out of the brothel. It's not easy, like I was telling you at the beginning, 
one day if you are in if we are in the brussel we cannot escape from the brussel so this victim this survivor they going talking with them they talking about their life their own life how they escape from the brussel and then this survivor they also also going also to the society to the community talking with the people why is our fault it's not our fault we don't want to be like this we don't want to be to have rape or to be in the brothel. And they explain about their life. And we have also some of the survivors who have HIV AIDS and then they're going to die. And some of participate with a uh, girl in the shelter that they are quite young and then they, they have also the last life, you know, the HIV AIDS, they're going talking with the society. And the people look at her and they start crying. And then they're talking also with the police. They're talking also with the minister. So now we start to uh, take the round table that the survivor talking with the people, explaining them that, please, help us. Because it's not our fault. And then another thing what I, I'm, what I want to, to share for all of you here in the United States that this subject is so big. A lot of people, they are so scared because it's so sad, so, it's so sad subject. The people, they just run away, they're, oh, well, seven years old girl have HIV and rape. No, I'm, I'm living for my own life. Because they are scared, but are they living and they happy? They are not because they're thinking about that. So it's better that you stand up and then listen to them and talk to them how you can help them. That is the best, and then to let the people know that what's going on in our country is also what's going on in the United States too. The trafficking, it is around the world. It's not just Cambodia. It is around the world. So we have to stop organized crime. I always talking like the organized crime, they are always well organized, but the people are again organized crime, they are not well organized. And then we need to support. We need your support so you can come to Cambodia, you know, just to the shelter. We have some, we have some young people from the university. Uh, I don't know which one. We'll have, maybe you can tell them. They come in Cambodia, they go into the shelter, they teach them in English, and they stay with them, they share their life with them, and they share their life with you. That is so great. It's open their heart, it's open their mind. That, that is great. Tell us maybe what a typical case would be like if somebody is rescued from a situation of slavery and brought into the shelter. What, what do you do? What do you provide in terms of services? How long does the person stay in the shelter? And how do you know when the person is ready to move back into society? Oh, I have to take very long time. I think the best way, the best way, take your time and you can go into our website that Somali.org is easy. They can explain everything to you. My English is so bad. I starting. I never go to school, so I have like some French accents. So we have like our association, we set up like A and Z. It mean like we have the outreach work. Almost it's ex victim now. Survivor. The survivor they go into the sex sector, they provide the condom, they provide um like shop, agents, talk to them how to stand up and then fight back. But it's not easy to go in the brothel and talk to them if not the pimp kill us. So we have our clinic that the girl can come in the clinic. We have the motorbike, moto tuk tuk, we call tuk tuk. They go around and take the girl and they can come to the clinic. And the clinic we provide them everything free. It's mean that medical care free. You know hundred percent of them have S C D problem because of they, they use a lot, not a lot, the condom, because we don't have enough condom to give to them. We can give to them five condom a day, but they have clients like 20 or 30, we don't have it. All, a lot of condom use plastic bag in the street. So imagine you, like after 30, they have to go to the clinic. They have to take a shower, they have to stay in, and they have to consult by the psychology. And also, we also identify girls in the sex sector, like we call peer educations. 
because of course that some of the girls they get old and they tell no, you know, we cannot, I cannot escape Somali, but I can help you. I have now my HIV aid. So they help us to give information. So when we have information that the girl come, the girl have been sold in the brothel, they are young, and then we have our investigation, they go and identify that we have little girl have been sold in the brothel and we work with the police to save them from a brothel. Save them from a brothel is not easy to get them to the shelter because they have been traumatized. So our survivor going talking to them and then after get them in the shelter. In the shelter they stay one to two weeks. But almost, you know, when they come in the shelter we have our ex victim, ex girl who stay in the shelter a long time. They can help each other, they love each other, they ask they are like the family, they very, very nice together. And then after we provide them the skill training. So we have hairdressing, waving, sewing, agriculture, short course, a lot of things. And somewhat I don't know how to talk in English. And then after they stay like one to two years. And then after we reintegrate them in the family, in the family or society. But before we reintegrate them in the society, we call pre reintegration. It means like, you know, you understand that they were in the brothel and then the shelter, they are just between themselves, not with another society. So bring them to the society, they're going in the morning working and then they come back at afternoon. Normally three months they say, okay, now you can integrate me. And then after we bring them to the society, like we start 100% to help them with a new shop, new life, new everything. And our staff stayed with them for one week. And then after we have the system of the follow-up for three, months, three years. But every month our staff going to talk to them, stay with them. You know, most of things that we just want them to be like, we are here, we are your family. It's not just the association or foundation, it's not just working. But we are the part of your life. So when you have a problem, come back to the shelter, we are here. And your methods are very successful. So many of these former victim survivors, as you call them, are, are back in the mainstream. But that's not always the case. Some of them go back and don't make it. So how do you help them? Of course, that after our work, you know, we have like 60%, 60%, we have successful. So successful when we count this mean like after three years, we call it successful. And then 40% of them, some of them, they got married, they disappear. Some of them, they die of HIV AIDS. Don't forget that HIV AIDS is affected a lot in Cambodia. And then, of course, some of them, they go back to the brothel because of, because of the lack of support by the family. The family, they come in and ask the money and sometimes they sell them back to the brothel. And sometimes, you know, like, I think the society, they treat them bad, so they go back. They go back, but we still have them, we go going to see them, and then sometimes they go back, they come back, they go back like a few times and then they come in. It's not easy to, to, to escape one time from the brothel. So do you have the sense that you're making progress against this problem, or is the problem continuing to grow at such a fast rate that it may be almost impossible. We, we have an ongoing situation with the economic crisis we're dealing with worldwide, which has made it easier for people to go into human trafficking and to take advantage of others. Um, how, how do you feel you're, you're faring in this struggle? I'm sometimes fed up. <laughs> I am sometimes fed up, fed up for, you know, sometimes you hear, maybe all of you hear that a lot of the association they were fighting against exportations. See, seen, I think like more than 10 years, a lot of the people going and fighting and fighting, but the problem, we have two kinds of the fighting. One kind, you fight with the paper in the office with the air conditions. And that is a lot, the NGO who like just, they are very, very talking, they good talking. But on the field work, I just invite you to the field work if nothing happens. And then the second, the second people who are, most of them are local people who stay in the country because they want to help. 
and they try to fight, they try to lose their life, and some of them have been killed, some of them have been kidnapping their own children, like my own children. And some of them, they say, okay, now I'm enough, because they have been again by the organized crime, pedophile, and they leave. But it's still uh, by helping the state departments, you know, I think the system of the T1, T2, T3, maybe after Bill can explain more about that, I'm, I don't know exactly, is make the country, the government better. Better is mean like, now we have implemented the law on 2008, and February 2008, we have the law, trafficking law. We have law, but we need the commitment from the people. The police, they get better, but the justice get very bad. And I think by now in the United States, I have, you know, I have Bill here and then he tried to get network, working with the people, but I'm always on the field work. So on the field work, it's still very stressful, very hard. And then with the crisis economic, it's very bad for us. What, what do you do to inspire yourself? You said sometimes you get fed up and then you come back and you continue the fight. How, how do you do that? When I get fed up, I drive the car, I go to the shelter to see my little girl, all the little girl, they call me grandmother. They are so lovely. And they look at me and I tell them, I have to leave and then I saw them, they have no family. They call me mommy, they call me grandmother and I am their mother. So if I run away, who will take care of them? Who? So what is a way that people in the audience today can get involved in doing something constructive? You said it's so important for people to become engaged. What, what can students at the university do that would be helpful? I think maybe first of all, you just talking between your friends, you know, keep talking about uh, how to end child exploitation or women exploitations. And then secondly, maybe sometimes you can also write a letter to your governments to be more and more engaged on this. You UN, write to you UN and human rights and ask them the question, what are they doing with the big building? What are they doing exactly? And then after everything that you give, everything that you want, you can, you can help. So going to the website, they, they, they explain you more because I'm now, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. Always in, in university, I get nervous because it's, it's my dream to go to school. And when I see all of you, I get a little bit jealous. <laughs> I want to go and I have to go one day to school. No, it's you, my you, dream. Well, it, and your dream will come true. Everything else that you're doing for good has come true. So I think that one will as well. Um, tell us, as you, as you go about your work, you said that obviously there is organized crime, there are pimps and others who have objected to what you're doing. What kinds of problems have they caused in, in, in your own life? In my own life? How, how have they fought back? And I was thinking specifically about what happened to your home. You know, when I start this, I know that my life is, is I make my life in, in, in dangerous, but I, oh, it's not easy for me. A lot of people, they tell me that I'm crazy. I am crazy. <laughs> I am crazy. But work like my work, save the, save the people, give the people hope and dream. That is great. They burn my house. It's okay, they burn my house. They threaten me, they kidnap my children, they rape my daughter, they, they sell them to brother and that is like one day when they have been kidnapping my children and I tell my children that it's my fault. I'm crazy and I have to leave office, I have to leave my work. Uh, because it's hard for me. It's hard that I make life of my children, you know, like dangerous. And then she looked at me, she told me, a few months after, you know, she told me, you know, mommy, I'm lucky to have you. How about all the children, all my friends in the shelter, because they grow up together. If you love me, you have to stay with them. 
and I'm, I had a big support from them. What do you hope to accomplish over the next 10 years? End the slave. You think it's, it's doable within a decade to end it? If all of you um, activate, not just speaking, but you know, speaking, speaking is very great, but we have to active. We have to be the real, the real fight. Fighting is not just sitting and then talking, but we have to stand up and then how to fight, how to get involved together, how to get the government, because I can save the children like, I, we can save like 6,000 now, but 6,000, 10,000 maybe they're going back to the brothel. If no um, implements the, um, uh, what is it calling? Um, justice? Um, law? No law implements, not a territorial law, not working together. Because now a lot of association, a lot of people, they're talking about, about trafficking, but they are never bring up together, never. And how we can work, how we can end the slave, we cannot. So I think that that is out of my capacity. But I think all of you, because you are in university, you have, you are entrepreneur, you can help me how to find it and how to fight and how to end. I know how to fight with the PIM. I know how to save the girl from the brothel. I know how to give them loving, loving, hug them. But I don't know how to go to re re um, the law. I don't know how, how to say the law. I don't know that. So we need all of you. And we need to work, real work, to set up a real work together. That is what we need. It's urgently. You know, you have to think that more you have one year less, two year less, more you have more children, more women have been killed and raped every day. Every day. Every day they have been killed, every day they have been raped. So please, now we have to stand up all together and then help. How to organize, how to help. That is a big work. You go to Bill, not to Somali, talk, you go to Bill and talk to him how to help us. And then how to be all together, university, private sector, NGO, government, how to sit together and work together. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you for sharing with us today, and hopefully we can take a few questions from the audience and continue the conversation for a few minutes longer. But thank you for being candid, and thank you for sharing a very tragic story that you're helping to turn into a better one because of your good work. I want to ask you, slavery takes uh, many forms today, and it can be found in uh, brothels, factories, farms, and battlefields. Uh, some have claimed that uh, the focus on the sex trade uh, detracts attention from other forms of slavery. Uh, I guess I have two, a two-part question. Do you think that this is true? And do you think that we should uh, prioritize the elimination of some kinds of slavery over others? By my side, I just want to be like, we have to end all the kind of slavery. Sex slavery, children slavery, you know, women and children have been slaves. We, we have I don't want to compare between sex slavery and the slavery of the children. We have to be we have to end both of them. Don't compare don't don't separate it. I'm work on the sex trade slave, but before they have been sex slave, they have been also slave by them by by the family or by or by the owner. We have to end both of them. Knowing how prevalent um, sex trafficking is here in the United States, what would your advice be to someone who wants to help open the first safe house shelter here in the United States for the women that have been sex trafficked in and sex trafficked from their own home cities here in the U.S.? In U.S., we have also um, we have also association, but I think around U.S. we have three shelter, right, Bill? We have just three shelter. You need more in around U.S. Um, you can connect with uh, you can connect with us, and we'll make maybe help you to connect with Ekpat, with uh, Polar Project. But please, 
when we finish, you go to the bill. He have no hair. It's, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy to remember him. And then he work instead. He know everyone here. I'm from Cambodia. I just know how to help you in Asia and Cambodia. I want to let everyone know about here in Orlando, we have the Florida Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And they do work identifying victims in Orlando and have safe places for them and provide counseling and education and everything. And so um, they're, so we, we actually are holding an event with them at UCF to raise awareness about their organization. Um, and it, it, it happens in Orlando, it happens in rural communities all around Orlando. So I guess I'm saying like for every, for people in the room who want to have a connection to your organization two years from now, helping. You're going to the website. You're going to www.somali.org. So Somali with L-Y, S-O-M-A-L-Y dot org. And then after you can connect with us all time and you have also my email, but I always take time to send you back the email because when I'm on the field work, I'm always spend my time with the children and girl. But you can connect with Bill and Bill make connection with my assistant Silo. It's easy to connect with us. Please don't 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 be scared to connect with us. And we always pass information, everything by the website, you know, by Twitter, by the Facebook. I just going to the Facebook today. It's amazing. <laughs> Just uh, one, one follow-up, because what you're talking about essentially is, is better networking. And what we're trying to do here at the university with this human trafficking focus we've had now for about eight years is to help different organizations get connected in the ways that you've just described. So we're reaching out to her organization and a lot of others so that we can have or, or draw more strength from our efforts collectively. Mm -hmm. So we can help you with that as well. And you, you can be also the, the, the member of the foundation because the survivor, we need more stronger member. It means survivor, university, young people, you know. So you can go to the internet and you can be the member of, of all. Because if you want to fight, we have to have a lot of people to fight it, sign out. If you want to write the, the, the letter to the governments, sometimes we need a lot, a lot of people like we want to end of slave. We want to end sex slave or slavery. I'm just a little shaken up because I'm very proud of you and it's very difficult for me because a lot of times I think about my ancestors and um, I imagine sometimes um, that they had a very difficult way. Just imagine coming on the transit, transit Atlantic ships from Africa coming over to the United States and um, it's very hard for me to face you and I'm, I'm very proud of you and I can't believe I can't even control myself right now. But I'm um, sorry. Oh, okay. Don't be sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, what I'd like to know is um, how many times have you gone around to universities around the United States and how much response have you gotten with regards to people um, taking action and coming over to Cambodia with you and um, organizing and um, you know helping you with um, I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. I know you can't even understand me, especially because I'm crying. My emotional, I can understand you as well. Okay. How many um, times have you gone around to universities around the United States and found that women are, um, 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 should I say, um, encouraged to join forces with you and come over to Cambodia with you? Um, how many times my boss over there he managed me very badly, <laughs> no. Um, he's, yeah, sometimes it's three, four times a year that I come to state. And always I have to, you know, I have to take my time in Cambodia because my work is a real work. And um, how many people are going to Cambodia? We have a lot. We have a lot, yeah. And still now we have, the problem is like, a lot of people come to our country and our association. They don't want to leave us after. And I get a big problem with their mother, with their, with their parents. <laughs> and then a little bit, they, a little bit they scare of me now. Somali, you have to send my, like, 
Sarah, Sarah, she was for Dong with us seven months. But her idea just to come like one month in Cambodia. And after two years, she stayed, still work with us. And next month, I have to push her in the, fly, in the plane. <laughs> go back to your country. We love her, but we want her to go back. And then after, she can come back. So if we go to the website, um, we can learn how to become more active and contribute financially or actually go and take trips over there to help? Yes. Okay, yes, great. Of course. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I lost my composure. No, don't be sorry. You know, emotional, we cannot stop emotional. Sometimes expressed by crying, that is great too. It's, you know, sometimes we have to express something. So please, and I understand you as well. And I think all of us are understand you. Very proud of you. I'm proud of all of you. <laughs> there are some of us here that are nursing students. And I'm curious about your experience as a patient in, in that capacity and the role of the medical community in Cambodia in relation to your cause. What is a question, please? Can you help me to? So I, I'm the bill that's been mentioned a few times tonight. <laughs> yes, I am bald. Um, <laughs> uh, um, nursing students are critical to us in Cambodia. Um, we currently, our medical services, we have one doctor who, besides Somali, I would say is the single most heroic person I've ever met. She's been with Somali since um, the, since Somali, the beginning. Be from the, beginning the very beginning. And she works seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, and she is the most delightful and most dedicated woman that you'll ever meet. Um, but what we need help with from nursing students, what, um, we just found out uh, this summer during our evaluation that we weren't doing blood tests and um, pelvic exams on our intakes because none of the staff in, in Cambodia thought that we could afford it. So um, we immediately committed the funds to, to do this. It's uh, $30 per exam, which is a lot of money in Cambodia. But what that allows us to do now is shift from um, responding to medical needs um, on a symptomatic methodology to a diagnostic methodology. So we're not waiting for symptoms to show themselves. Um, and where nursing students can help us is um, in two ways. Uh, number one, in volunteering time to work with our doctors and our medical team in Cambodia. But number two, and even I think more importantly, is we have survivors who want to, to work in this way with, um, with incoming victims, and they need training. Um, and in Cambodia, the, um, the educational system uh, is not as strong as, as we'd like to see. And so when we can mentor survivors with, um, with professionals, even young professionals like you, that gives us an amazing ability to advance the involvement of survivors in the, um, in the uh, recovery process. I'm curious as to what the reaction of the medical community is to people who have been victimized in that way. It's, it, it, it runs a broad range from we have, as horrible as it sounds, there are doctors in Cambodia that um, the value of a child um, of their virginity is, is very high because um, of, of two reasons, because they, um, they know that they won't get HIV AIDS from a virgin. And number two, there's a belief throughout Asia that by having um, sex with a virgin that you increase your luck. And so we actually have, on, on the worst side of the medical community, we have doctors that are re-sewing girls up so that they can be sold again as virgins. To the, to the far other side, we have doctors like Dr. Molly who dedicate their lives to helping these young victims. We have doctors like Dr. Minchi Voon who is um, in charge of the HIV program for all of Cambodia, for the national program. So we have a wide, um, the, the medical system goes to, to both edges. Um, we have some very, very dedicated medical professionals there, but we also have some very corrupt medical professionals. You've mentioned that the Cambodian government does not do enough to fight the problem of slavery. And you've also mentioned that many of the victims are kids as young as five years old. When you rescue them, is, does the government, 
is the government able to send any special assistance to them, or are there laws in Cambodia which prevent, you know, children younger than a certain age from working in brothels, so that at least when you see them, you can call the police attention and get them to focus on them? Oh, I think that may you we are far away. Cambodian state is really very different. Um, our governments, they never provide you helping the little girl who have been saved. If, you know, I want one thing, I don't know, I don't know how to talk. In your country, you have the system of the government take care of the people, you have the system of, um, um, you have a lot of system to helping the children, the girl, the young people. In our country, no. No, if they don't kill us, that is great. And they don't care about... It's not... I have TV, it's not easy to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you ask me to explain you and I have to say something real. The real thing is like, in front of you, they working. Like I tell you, we have two kinds of work, and the paper is great. Behind that, the people, they don't care. How they can care about the girl who had been raped or the girl who had been in a brothel? They don't care that. And the people, they don't care about that. You know, it's like, in Cambodia, we have one word. In the room, we have Cambodian people. Can you help me to translate? Any Cambodian people? Any Cambodian people here can help me to translate? We call your head is your hair. So it means that your problem is you, it's not us. Like this, right? It's like your head is your hair. It's not your head, my hair. That is a word in Cambodia. So it means like you have your problem, it's your own problem. And then you don't have the shelter. No one want to care that, no one want to come to us. Sometimes we invite them to come to see us. No, no. Man, help us. I tell you one thing, since I starting the work, the man who come in my life that I really have the confidence and he really showed that he's a good man, it is Mr. Bill. He, even he bald, he have no hair, but he's very good heart. <laughs> yeah. And the girl loving him like father, uncle, and he's the one who showed the girl that he's the real man. And I have another brother, Norman Chenroa. He's also no hair too. <laughs> and that is, we have few men come in our life. And last month in Cambodia, we have two volunteer men come from Spain. He's also, they are also very good. But men, Cambodian men, I can trust again, Bill. No. They are sometimes we find them they are good men, but the the mentality drive them bad. They are good men, good, but not enough. You know they are good, but say, you know they are prostituted because they want to, and because they are bad luck. Because I think it's traditional to put them this way. It's not easy. We have time for one more question. And I don't have a question for you. I do have a question for everyone in this room. And I think what we're hearing tonight is that we do have to open our eyes because we have things going on in this country. We have the town hall meetings that are going on and we have so many things that are very similar in this country that may not affect our front door, but if we look in our community, we know it's going on. And I pray that you will find the strength in your community, and I pray that this community will stand up and help you in whatever way we can.